Okay, let's take a look at this video to just describe some of the ways that I use extensive reading in my class. Students open up a quiz and the quiz is timed for 10 minutes. They begin the quiz, they get another warning about the time, and you can see they have their question up top and below they'll write their essay. Who was your best friend when you were a child? They also have a countdown um, timer. Now I'm gonna just put in some nonsense tense, text, and then we'll finish writing, finish writing the essay, submit and finish, submit it again, review it, make sure it's okay, looks good. We come back to this page, we have one essay done, but we can do another one, same quiz. And every time we start a new essay on the quiz, you can see we get a different topic. What's the best place to enjoy nature in Sapporo? Well, we type it out, type our essay, submit it, and review. We come back the next day, try it again, and we get a new topic. So with one quiz, this student can probably do about 70 practice essays if she wants to. Now the teacher can decide how many to require and the students can do extras after that. You can continue on and on and on forever. Um, so besides just the essays, students can do other kinds of practices too. For example, um, please describe the picture. In the same way, every time they open up the, the quiz, the picture quiz, they'll get a new picture to describe. And we can put movies, we can put music, we can put anything there that we want. This is a typical uh, academic essay. Your government announced that it wishes to build a military base near your community. What are the good points and bad points? What's your opinion? And again, there are about 200 of these that students can go through. Um, now, this is the teacher view. How does the teacher deal with this manage it, how does the teacher give feedback or grades? You can see now we're in the Robert Gettings mode for my class. We'll open up the same class, click on the same writing topics, simple quiz, and we can see there are four attempts. Now, one of my students from long ago did one, so I'll have to cover up her, her name for privacy. But you can see here, that um, uh, let me oh oh ne And you can see down the bottom of the page, we can find for, for every quiz, we can see the student's name, their mail address, the condition the quiz is in, is it finished or not, when it was started and completed, the time it took to finish the quiz, and also the grade. So Moodle automatically gives us this information. And for timed extensive reading, except especially it's really important to see the relationship of the time taken to finish the quiz and the grade the student has. So let's look at our student that we, we saw before. And um, we have one student, she's done three quizzes. I'm gonna open up the first quiz. And when we open it up, we'll come to a page that we can access all of her work from. You can see there's one, two, and three up top. First one, when was your best, uh, who was your best friend when you were a child? Go to the second quiz she wrote. What is the, uh, what is the best place to enjoy nature in Sapporo? And the third one was something funny that happened this week. 
So the teacher can conference with the student, talk to her, go back and forth, and directly talk to her about the good and bad points. Or the teacher could also give her a grade. So this, in this way, um, it's not really necessary to mark every piece of work that the, um, that the student does, but we have that record of the work, which gives the teacher a really valuable um, asset when they want to give feedback to help the students um, writing improvement and growth. Okay, time to extensive writing in Moodle. What does Moodle do behind the scenes to give the student the opportunity to take the same quiz again and again and get a random topic every time? Well, the Moodle quiz is set up with the timing set to 10 minutes. That can be done for the quiz. It could be 10 minutes or 20 minutes, five minutes. It's up to the teacher. There's only one essay question in the quiz, but that essay question is selected randomly each time the student opens the quiz from a quiz category of many questions. And on the right, you can see some of the questions in that category. Um, so let's go on to writing. What is writing? Now for writing, I like to be a little bit, um, uh, not so serious, a little bit silly to start off. And let's start off, please, I, ask you to think about your writing. Do you write more now than you did 10 or 15 years ago? Think about 10, 15 years ago, before the invention of the smartphone. Do you write more now than then? What do you think? There's no correct answer. Everyone is a little bit different. What was the first thing that you wrote today? Imagine, get out of bed. Ah. What's the first writing you did today? Did you use writing to communicate today? Was it a personal communication, business communication, both? How many times, how often have you written today? A lot of people, if you think even the short, like 20 second message, we write a lot. And finally, the silly question, how many five paragraph academic essays have you written today? Now, what's the reason that I'm asking this? We can see human beings do a lot of writing, but we don't often write five paragraph high school academic essays. Um, we usually write to communicate, even to remind, to communicate with ourselves by writing a shopping list or SNSs, things like that. When 15 years ago, I used to make a lot of telephone calls. Now, I don't really make telephone calls at all. Maybe once, maybe two or three times a week, but only for work. So when we think of writing, Writing is one of the four skills of, of language learning, the language use, use. And writing is essentially, in our daily lives, used for communication. So, but being more silly, imagine that teaching speaking the same way that we traditionally teach, the, teach writing, the five paragraph academic essay. Now, someone asks us a question and, oh, Pre-speaking, I have to do pre-speaking, brainstorming. What, what do I want to say? What do I want to say? I have to go over and over in my mind, what's the best way to say this? I gotta, teacher, this is, my, this is what I wanna say. Give me some feedback on it. Or cut out my grammar mistakes with your red pen. Then I take the teacher's advice or my peer's advice, revise what I want to say. And then I produce, I speak, I, I give the message. Now, that's really silly because um, what we're talking about is not interactive um, speaking for communication. We're talking basically, it becomes giving a presentation, doing a presentation or making a speech. So what we're doing 
with this, if we speak the way we learn writing, we're, we're only speaking for interaction. We're not speaking for interaction. We're speaking for production, um, uh, a speech or a, a presentation. Somehow, our traditional writing training has moved away from the idea of using writing for interaction and focusing mostly on writing for production. So let's move on now to think about Sefer. What's Sefer A1, B1, or pre-A1 to B1 level writing? But first, let me check how much you know about Sefer, if you could. Um, just let me know by writing something in the chat. Very little or nothing about Sefer, right? One, two, three, four. A little bit, but not enough to explain its main points to someone else. Enough to explain the main points to someone, or a lot. What's your case? How much do you know about Sefer? Maybe you've never even heard of it. Ah, it's okay. Maybe you're an expert. If, if you're an expert, maybe you don't want to listen to my, to my presentation. Okay, um, so what's Sefer? Sefer is famous for can-do statements. So for example, I can uh, describe my family, uh, something like that. Now, Sefer doesn't focus on what we can't do on our mistakes. Sefer usually focuses on what we can do. The Sefer approach tends to look at the learner as a social agent. The, the, agent, the learner is not just receiving knowledge from the teacher or not just practicing conversation, but the, the, the learner is learning the language and creating knowledge with their um, fellow students and the teacher in their own right. Sefer tends to favor an action-oriented approach towards language learning, not passive, really using the language um, actively for communication and interaction. Sefer also tends to stress communication for real life tasks. If you look at the Sefer descriptors, the list of can-do statements, you'll see a lot of them have to do with actually doing things in society. Again, Sefer looks at what learners can do, not what they cannot do. So that gives you a general idea about Sefer. In general, also, Sefer is moving away from a focus on the structure of the language to the communicative use of the language. Now, if you don't ha have the recent version of Sefer, the Common European Framework of Reference for Languages, Learning and Teaching Assessment, the Companion Volume. The Companion Volume was um, published finally in 2020, and you can download the PDF here. Now, Sefer was originally, I think, published in 2001 or around that time. And the Companion Volume has, the, what pe the Sefer people usually say is it hasn't, Essentially, it hasn't changed. All the parts that were there are, are still there, just expanded. And um, uh, so, uh, especially, there's a pre-A1 section now for really beginners in, um, in learning a language. Like you, they might be learning the alphabet. And there's also some fo uh, expanded sections on mediation, which is, um, acting between two people or um, a text and someone who needs to know what's in the text and helping that person to understand it by using uh, more than one language usually, sometimes using their, their, um, the, their native language and also the target language. But Sefer is also focused on plurilingual learning. So Sefer has definitely moved away from the native speaker as the ideal speaker to looking at every language learner, every language user in the world is, has many languages, not just one or two, that they can call on in some, to some extent. And that when we learn and teach and use languages, that that's an important thing to remember. So the plurilingual and the mediation sections of Sefer, we won't talk about much in this um, section, but um, you can probably find 
something on my YouTube page that has uh, a little bit about mediation. So, separate writing for interaction, writing for production, um, which separate does both. Separate deals with both. Now, writing for production, production especially involves accuracy in language. And writing for interaction especially involves fluency. Let's look at accuracy first. If we focus on accuracy, um, we're writing for usually writing for production or publication. This would be the, the five um, the five paragraph college essay. It would be a newspaper article, um, a report to your boss, your CV if you're looking for a job, things that are really important that you're producing to represent yourself in some way. Very often, especially for the five par paragraph essay, we deal um, with the process writing as a way of teaching, brainstorming, drafting, revising, and such. Editing, especially the teachers red pens. All of those teachers and all those red pens have traditionally been a very, very important part of teaching writing and teaching accuracy in writing. Well, what about fluency? Fluency is more dealing with uh, writing quickly, speaking quickly, same as in conversation, writing for interaction, communication for um, understanding is really important. This morning, if you opened up your SNS and you sent uh, a little message to uh, your friend or your um, family member or to your colleague and sent it off, that's writing for interaction, that's fluency. Now, mistakes still can come, can have a problem, but we check more for meaning and task completion. For example, the famous mistake for uh, an SNS message is, message is to type something out, autocorrect, changes one essential word, and it becomes a very embarrassing message or a message no one can understand. So we still need to, to edit, we need to check, but it's not as important as if we were going to publish that message in a, in a major journal. So extensive writing is especially good for fluency because extensive writing focus on, focuses on writing um, for often for pleasure or for practice. Um, it, it focuses on a lot of writing very quickly, doing writing very quickly. So let's go to Sephra now. Now, Sephra, we used to say for Sephra, it was focused on the four skills. Um, um, reading, writing, speaking, and listening. Now, the, the new companion volume has changed the focus a little bit, the description a little bit, but the four skills are still there. Now they talk about receptive skills, for example, listening, and reading and productive skills, speaking and writing. But looking at those two kinds of skills, receptive and productive, they also think about interaction being the essential reason that we use, the, the, we use those skills. And even more, interaction is, is always between people, but mediation, is a further advance of that. Mediation is using those skills, using listening, reading, speaking, writing, and interactive skills to be a go-between and to be able to explain something or to help a group move forward through the use of communication and language. So Sefer has loads and loads of descriptive skills. Now, Sefer is really, really good point is that it is so detailed. It can give you lots of good ideas of how to develop uh, your writing classes, uh, writing tasks to create, and things like that. But unfortunately, Sefer has a really horrible problem. It's the same. Sefer is really detailed. It's just so vast. So there are so many writing um, Sefer descriptor scales. It's impossible to sit down and grasp at one time. Um, so that detailed, the number right, that, de that detail is a good and a bad point. Don't let Sefer get you down because it's, you'll be reading hundreds of pages if you try to just read it. Take it bit by bit. 
I've looked at Sefer a lot, and I've found that every time I go back to the companion volume and look for something to try to understand some aspect of language learning or teaching, I find a new insight. So Sefer is, is, is there sort of um, to not be a blueprint or guide, but to stim stimulate your imagination and to challenge you to look at teaching and learning in new ways. So if you can see here, we're looking at the separate descriptor scales for overall written production from pre-A1 to B1. And here I have pre-1. I chose this one because overall written production is very, very short. Um, so from pre-A1 can give basic personal information, maybe with the use of a dictionary. Now, as, this, as, it, as the learner gets more language, you, language ability, they can give information in writing about matters of personal re relevance, like likes and dislikes, family pets, uh, families or pets, um, using simple words and basic expressions. And the first one, they're just basically down to single words, but here they're getting a little complex in A1. They can also write simple isolated phrases in sentences, but very simple sentences. For example, if you've taught a children's class, um, you learn animals or body parts or family members or objects or types of food. And you can say, that's a hot dog, or I like hot dogs, or I can eat five hot dogs. Okay, so it's, it, it's at that level of... Um, plus a little more complexity of, of uh, isolated phrases and sentences. And as the, the learner grows stronger and stronger in vocabulary and ability to use different grammar functions, they can come to the point of A2 where they can write a series of simple phrases and sentences together. Here we have the beginning of a story or a paragraph, but they're still using simple phrases and simple sentences, maybe they might link the sentences or phrases with connectors like and or but or because, but still a basic level. Finally, B1. B1 is the first, what uh, Sefer says, an independent user. Just taking baby steps, but can, doesn't need to, um, to have help all the time. They can write a straightforward connected text on a range of familiar subjects within his or her field of interest by linking a series of shorter discrete elements into a linear sequence. Now, if you can understand that at first reading, you're a better person than I. Uh, basically what they're saying is that um, they can make a story or they can make an argument. They can make a, they can tell you their opinion. They can describe their neighborhood, um, but familiar subjects, they still can't talk about rocket science yet. Um, unless rocket science is within the field of interest of the, of the language learner, okay? Um, and they can link shorter sentences or phrases into a linear sequence, something that has um, rationale and that follows, flows in a, in a pattern. Now, let's look at the general linguistic range descriptors. This is only a partial list because it would take three slides to show the whole thing. In general, the pre-A1 descriptors, there are only a few of them, but when we get to B1, there's more and more. Now I've colored some of the words red because these are the main things I'd like you to take a look at. And if we look at the next one, we're going to look at some examples of, um, of pre-1 to B1 in uh, the Cambridge um, English qualifications from starters, movers, flyers, in B1 preliminary for schools. So at A1, again, remember, remember isolated words and basic expressions, maybe some signs to express uh, meaning and give simple information. A1, more basic structures in one clause or one clause sentences. Now there's some mistakes or reduction of, of words or elements, but still, you know, they can get their message across even with the mistakes. A2, they have a wider range of basic languages, and with that, they can do much, much more. Even though they may have to restrict what they say because they just can't, re they don't have the words or the way to say it. And they still might have to use a lot of uh, signs 
or gestures to um, to get the meaning across. But in the red, they can use basic sentence patterns. And they can talk about themselves and other people, what other people do, places, possessions, and things like that. So the, wi the wider range of language, of vocabulary and grammar, of experience, lets them talk about more things still within their world. In B1, they have enough range of language to describe unpredictable, unpredictable situations. Something is, that just suddenly came up, they can talk about it sometimes. They can explain the main points of an idea or a problem with reasonable precision. So they can talk about also about abstract and cultural topics such as music and film. So they're, they're just starting off on um, being able to talk about the world beyond their experience as well and their feelings and ideas and emotions. But at the same time, they may be making some mistakes, but the mistakes don't block the, the understanding of, um, of the message that much. So next we're going to look at some examples of, of these levels by looking at some tests. And I've chosen the Cambridge test because they're the ones I'm most familiar with. Look, looking at the starters, movers, flyers, and, and art tests are um, for children. Key and preliminary for schools are for probably high school students. The, uh, they only differ from the adult tests and the topics are more familiar to high school or to, to students than, what, than some adult topics, for example, like business or jobs or, or things like that. Okay, so let's take a look. Now, these are, all, these are all coming from Cambridge's website, which you can access at the link in the form of that page. Now, this is a test for pre-A1. You can see they're filling in words or answering a question with how many birds are there? Three. They don't have to answer there are three birds in the nest or in the hat, they can just say three. What are the birds doing? Singing, oh, cool. something like that. A1 is moving up a little bit. We still have these one word answers, but uh, the sentence has a lot of action in it. And we have answer the questions, what's the man with the white beard doing? The man with the white beard is doing so many things. Um, Sitting on a bench would be okay. Saying hello to the woman in the pink shirt would be okay. Uh, but probably sitting on the bench or sitting or waving or holding a cane. Uh, who is in the red car? A boy and a girl. Um, or a more complex answer would be okay. They're, a boy and a girl are in the red car and they're looking out the back window. That's a little bit too high for A1, but if you got an answer like that to this test, you say, um, this student is not a one student. This student is an A2. Now I'll write two sentences about the picture. Uh, uh, for example, um, the woman is smiling. Um, the man is selling ice cream. The dog is waiting. It could be anything at all. Now, also notice, I've taken um, an example also of students' answers, and they're hard to see, so I've rewritten them in red. Now, one dog is brown and one dog is white and black. The student had that, okay. What is the, what's the girl in the black skirt doing? The student's answer was water. Oh, maybe there's water on that tray, but it's not the, the perfect answer, but still, it answers the question. Where are the flowers? next to the tree. Uh, next to doesn't have, this, have a space, but it, it's okay. It gets the idea across. Um, two sentences, the car is red. A boy he is jumping has a red shirt. Again, not perfect, but able to make the sentences. And uh, the, the Sefer scales, uh, don't judge a person by perfection, just what they can do. So this student can make sentences, with, make, make simple sentences with one clause, with some 
problems, but still understandable. Okay, A2 gets up to, we're going towards making um, paragraphs now. And if you look at this, you can see um, it's a very traditional three picture test where you have to write a paragraph, a short paragraph, uh, 25 words or so about the story. Um, so one day Tom and Kate went to the beach, went to beach, played in volleyball. Tom throws strongly ball and Kate didn't catch, but suddenly dolphin hit ball. In the end, Kate caught ball. But problems, but I understand, okay? And uh, the communication was fairly clear with some problems. Now, if the student wrote with less problems, they would get a higher score. If they wrote with probably no mistakes at all and wrote a quite a long one, they'd probably be not A2, but B1. Okay, three astronauts, aliens, eating. The astronaut find aliens. The aliens and the astronauts start talking. The one alien invited to eat an astronaut, an astronaut because the astronaut have to eat. And after the astronaut and the aliens go to their houses. The closest thing that comes to a, an error of meaning is the one alien invited to eat an uh, a astronaut. The astronaut is not for dinner. <laughs> the astronaut is coming to dinner, okay? So it's a, it, but still, we get the general meaning. It's a, it's a suitable answer for, for the test. For the A2 for schools, not for children, we have um, a very traditional kind of Cambridge question, an email. Um, you're going shopping with your English friend, Pat, tomorrow. Write an email to Pat. Say, and they list three things that you have to write in the email. Write 25 words or more. Now, the B1 test, a pet test, used to have something similar, but write 45 words or more. And it dealt with things that would use modal verbs, like apologies or suggestions. Okay, uh, look at the three pictures and make a story, the same as the astronaut and, and the dolphin playing uh, volleyball. Now, before I mention that if the volleyball um, stories writer came out with something with not so many mistakes. They would not be A2, but probably B1. And the way that Cambridge scores there, um, uh, the assessment scale, scale for Cambridge's tests usually does that. A scale of one, the target here is A2. In A2, the middle score of A2 is three. A score of one is A1, it's too low. They don't pass the test. A1, and A2 between the two, um, it's hard to say which one, a two, that would not be so good, but if they get some better scores in the, other, in the other two, it might balance out. So an unacceptable content would be irrelevancies and misinterpretations of the task may be present. Target reader is minimally informed. Well, this task, the, the, there were some things there was really nothing irrelevant. And we, we learned about all three pictures. So this is probably a very, very good score for content. I would say it'd probably be a four or maybe a five, but I'm not a Cambridge rater. So don't try to rate um, uh, separate by yourself because you'll fail. The people who actually rate these kinds of things, kinds of tests have very, 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 uh, exhausting training. So uh, organization, text is connected and coherent using basic linking words and a limited number of cohesive devices. Okay, this doesn't have so many. Text is connected using basic high frequency linking, linking words. Oh, la, 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 la. But in the end, it's pretty good. Okay. Um, language uses, um, uses basic vocabulary reasonably appropriately, uses simple grammatical forms with some degree of control, Errors may impede meaning at times. Actually, for me, there were errors, but I understood pretty much what the person was trying to say. So I think that would get a good score too. So my, my reason for doing this is to point out that 
Sefer is moving away from counting the number of mistakes. It's rejecting that completely and looking at, can it be understood? Do the errors block meaning? Um, does the writer have control um, and use grammatical forms of vocabulary correctly? So the things that they can do, not what they cannot. Next, what's extensive writing? And I've um, taken, the, taken this uh, definition from Piccolo. It's not really a definition more, it's an explanation because you won't find a, an accepted definition of extensive writing and they change over the years. So extensive writing is when learners do a large quantity of informal writing. It can be a little bit formal, but it's usually not, um, it's not red pen corrected writing. Okay. And they do the writing on a wide range of topics and in various styles. So different topics, dolphins playing volleyball, aliens, um, going to the circus. Um, but basically, um, the style for that three picture one is the same. Now they would do, do various styles, not just the three picture. They might just have, um, you know, uh, how was the weather this morning? You know, how did you feel this morning? How, um, uh, tell me about uh, a family member that you, you like, something like that. So intensive writing, on the other hand, is writing in which learners have to be accurate. They have to be careful of their grammar and of making mistakes. It's really different than extensive writing. With extensive writing, there is less emphasis on accuracy and grammar and more on fluency and expression. So it's not so important to concentrate on the errors, but just to know what happened between the two kids and the dolphin and to focus on what the learner is trying to say. So what kind of writing is extensive writing? The blogs, journals, free writing, discussion forums are really fantastic forms of communicative extensive writing. Chats and SNSs, email exchanges, pen friends, creative writing, writing stories, poetry, essay genre writing, description, definition, blah, blah, blah. Like the five paragraph essay, but shorter, faster, and don't worry about mistakes, just meaning. Any kind of writing can be extensive writing. If it has an ex emphasis on the expression of, and, um, of lots of ideas, not just doing one topic and finishing, but doing many, many different topics and styles. And de-emphasizing perfection, editing, and accuracy. Perfection, editing, and accuracy, oh, we do tomorrow in tomorrow's class. In today's class, we do practice and we focus on fluency by doing extensive writing. So what kind of errors do we focus on? And again, for intensive writing, spelling, punctuation, grammar usage, and style errors are really important because they show us up if we make mistakes. When a piece of writing is going to be published, even that can be to, uh, uh, to a Cambridge test uh, analyzer, or it can be to the school newspaper. When one particular type of error is the class's focus, you might want to focus um, intensively on an error. If this teacher is like saying, okay, today let's look at our writing and focus on subject verb agreement. Also, we point out, we focus on um, these kinds of spelling, punctuation, grammar usage, and style errors when we know that the area er, error is useful for a particular student to be aware of. Now, uh, this student has, um, has been having problems with subject verb agreement for weeks and weeks and weeks. And um, so we make it a particular point to focus on those with the student. So we don't always focus on all errors. We focus on errors intentionally because of what we want to teach or because of our particular student. Now, for extensive writing, we have to think about global and local errors. When global, global errors are errors that make it difficult to understand what the, um, what the, what the writer is trying to say. If you have a global error, 
you're not going to be able to read through the error and say, I know what they meant, but they made a mistake. You're going to say, I don't know what they meant. And what's this about? Um, when the writing task was not completed, it's also important to focus on those kinds of errors. For example, the student only wrote about two of the three pictures in the story. Uh, there is no or little focus on local errors when we're doing extensive writing. No or little focus on spelling, punctuation, grammar, usage, and style errors. That's for tomorrow. Today, we're just focusing on extensive writing and communication. So what's the goal of the writing task? No. When we teach, we should hopefully have an idea of what we want to teach at this particular lesson. And um, usually for teaching writing, it's really great to have a rubric or can-do statement or very, very clear directions so that students will know themselves when they're not quite meeting the mark for the, for the goal of the lesson. So for example, in this case, um, the goal of the lesson is to do extensive writing about three picture stories. And we want to check, we want the student to check, did the, was the student able to write a story? They did it okay, they were fantastic. The student thinks that they need more work to, con to, to continue, they need to try again. Did the student write about all three pictures? They look at, ah, I wrote about the first and the third picture, but I forgot the third. Uh, I need more, need to do more work. I said, ah, I looked at the, I, I wrote about all pictures, but the third one is a little bit weak, so, but it's still okay, okay? Um, maybe the teacher in this case wants the students to focus on the grammar point or the, of, uh, the writing point of um, using and and then. Again, the student can judge. Well, my teacher can understand my writing. Or we might say, I showed my writing to my friend and my friend can understand my writing. So the teacher wants the student to think about, can other people understand the writing? And they could check that with the teacher themselves or with a friend or a classmate. I checked my story. In this case, the teacher wants to teach, to encourage the students to do a very simple, simple editing. So this is not so much extensive unless it's a very, very quick check. Just like the same kind of check we do before we send out the SNS that might have a um, one word mistake in it. So why do extensive writing? We should teach for a reason and we should choose our methods for a reason too. So intensive writing is really good to increase the amount of writing practice time students can have in class. Now there's only so much time. And if you remember my example in the beginning, the Moodle example of writing a very simple essay, um, the teacher can do that in class with the students. They can do it on paper, but if they do it in, on Moodle, the students can also do it in their free time at home and still not, um, and still keep it extensive because of the time limit. They're not gonna spend like a 30 minutes trying to write the essay because they can't. They have to become fluent. They have to do it real fast and they have to get it over with. Moodle will close down after 10 minutes. If they want to continue, they can do another essay and under the, under the same kind of fluency um, pressures. It gives the student more time and chances to use the vocabulary or grammar that they have been learning. If students only write one thing very slowly, they don't have very much chance to use a lot of different kinds of vocabulary or grammar. And they're picking that up not only just from the teacher in the writing class, but from other classes as well. It builds their confidence. Now, the more practice we have, the more confidence we can have, especially if we get some supportive coaching and feedback. Actually, people have found, researchers have found that extensive writing can improve students' accuracy in writing, can lower their stress with writing tasks, and they can actually enjoy, maybe because of the gamification aspect of having to finish it all in five minutes or 10 minutes or, or whatever. Student extensive writing provides a useful information for the teachers. Remember when we looked at the, my example of the, the student who wrote three essays, after she wrote the three essays, I could have a conference with her, go to Moodle, click on each of the three essays, 
and we could talk together. I could use that information about how she did the essays to coach her, to praise her, to point out some things she could improve, to ask to see if she has any questions that she wants to talk to me about the, the task. What's timed extensive writing good for? And what is it? Now, timed extensive writing is pretty much the same as extensive writing, but the tasks are shorter. And each task has a time restriction. So there's not as much time to carefully think, plan, and write a long assignment. Instead, they have to do quickly think and write a shorter assignment. Instead of doing a 30 minute assignment, do three 10 minute assignments. Focus on fluency, quick tasks, a uh, quick response and task completion. Beating, and again, beating the clock does add a gamification feeling. And especially if you make it very strict so that the students will probably um, fail to finish, I don't know, one third of the time. So they said, ah, I didn't finish, but nothing they can do except go on and take the, another task that's similar and try to do better. So extensive writing has an emphasis on meaning and communication of ideas and a de-emphasis on assessment, especially summative assessment. So we're not so much interested in telling the students what they did wrong, but what they did right and how they can adjust their writing so they do more that's right. Okay, ordinary writing and timed writing. Now this is the, the simplest way to, say it, to, to, to show you. Same task, but there's more of the tasks in, in timed extensive writing. When do we use ordinary? When do we use timed extensive writing? Well, it depends on what you want to teach. One is not good, one is not bad, one is not better or worse. It really depends on what do you as the teacher want to teach? What do your students want to learn? For example, for ordinary writing, just one task, but take it slowly, take it at your own time. <clears throat> it's good for teaching skills for a new task. The first time that students did a three picture story, I would have them do it slowly, let them think about it, uh, ask me questions, you know, get into it slowly. I might also want to teach them more about connecting words. If you remember the teacher who did the rubric before, one of them to use and and then. So I would teach them, give them examples, help them to understand when to use and and then. It's also would be good in this case for me personally, I would say to focus on verb tense because when you write a story, it can be in the past tense or it can be in the present progressive tense. A boy and a girl are playing volleyball on the beach. It's a sunny day. The, the, there's a fish, there's a fish in, in the water, okay? Or a boy and a girl were playing volleyball on the beach. It was a sunny day. Either one is okay. So it would really be depending on, <clears throat> on what the teacher wants to focus on. It's also good for dealing with vocabulary or style. Um, letting the students slowly look up words or giving them vocabulary that suits the task. So Again, what would I, what would I want to have this to focus on the teaching? I would want the students to learn how to tell a story. I'd want them to remember that when they tell the story, when they do this task, there are three pictures they should write about. Um, I wrote this time, I, I could tell a story in, in the past. Uh, personally, either one would be okay, but I wouldn't probably do both. If I wrote I could tell the story in the past or the present progressive. It was like, huh? Students would get confused. Today, I, I, I might say, I could tell the story in the past. And then tomorrow, I'd give them the same rubric, but I changed it to, I could tell the story in the, in the, um, pres <coughs> in the present progressive. So they could focus intensely on the differences between those tests at different times. I could use and, but, and then, okay? My friend could understand my story. So this kind of thing would be appropriate for a extensive writing, ordinary extensive writing, slow writing story. And you can see we don't really focus on whether 
dolphin was spelled with an E is a mistake or not, as, as one of the, the writers did in the earlier picture. Okay, what about timed extensive? What do you want to teach? Well, what's it good for? Timed extensive uh, writing is really good for practicing and for individual coaching, especially because afterwards we have lots of samples of the students writing about the same skills as the ordinary writing, really exactly the same skills. We want the story, we want three pictures, we want to focus on a tense, connecting words. Also, if we have many stories, students will have to use a range of vocabulary. One vocabulary set is about a beach, the other is about aliens, the next one is about a circus. So it's good to really challenge the students to pull in the things they've learned uh, from other areas of their um, language learning. It's good for training for thinking skills, skills for a task. Uh, and this comes into telling the whole story, talking about the three, three pictures. Also, this, the thinking skills, oh, this is in the past, right? I have to decide. I'm going to put everything in the past. And basically, practice makes perfect. What would go in the rubric? I could tell a story. I could write about all three pictures. I could tell a story in the past. I could use and, but, and then. My friend could understand the story. The same things. But first time they did it slow, they learned the task. Now they're doing it fast and they're practicing. And it doesn't have to be 10 minutes. It depends on how fast your students usually write. Time your students and adjust the time to match their, their writing speed. Students, that's your students. And this is what I just mentioned before. Is you, have to, you have to adjust. And it's best for um, extensive, timed extensive writing tasks to be short. Five minutes, 10 minutes is great. 15 minutes is, it's, it's not so good anymore. 30 minutes, I would rather not time it. I'd rather do it just as an ordinary writing task. Um, unless my students were very, very advanced and were writing very, something very difficult. So you just measure what your students can do, say in free writing, or give them a, a similar task time them for 10 minutes, have them count the words and tell you, or do it on Moodle, where Moodle can count the words for you. And then you, you adjust the time and the difficulty of the task together. If the students are doing free writing, they're not gonna need much time, but if the students are, are, are writing about something more abstract at a B1 level or a high A2 level, or a new task, they might need more time. So that's really up to the, it's really case by case, for your students and also for your for your goals in the task. Okay, let's move on to something. Again, uh, we looked at this before, the general ling linguistic range, moving from isolated words and easy words to writing paragraphs, unpredictable, general, um, uh, abstract ideas, giving opinions and stuff like that, be one. And we're not going to look, look at this slowly again, but I just outline the words in red, because I want to look at how to deal with a prompt and design writing tasks for, um, for your students using a prompt. And this prompt is a picture. It's a picture, of, I think, of an older couple uh, sitting on a bench looking out at a pond with a, the hill and the forest in the, in the, in the foreground, in, the, in front of them. So let's think, for pre-A1, Students should be able to write isolated words and basic expressions about this. And if you remember the Cambridge example, I'm going to follow that. There are green, what's in the mountain? Well, maybe green trees. The woman wearing is wearing a blouse, a pretty blouse, a white blouse. Um, it could be many different, a long sleeved blouse. Long sleeved blouse is probably not pre one. But um, simple answers. How many people are there? Two. Let's move up to A1, where the students should be able to use some basic structures. We want to, we want to have them practice um, doing maybe one clause sentences too. So <laughs> simply write three sentences about the picture. Okay? It's just open-ended. And uh, if the students, um, this is also very good 
to, if you're wondering, are your students A1, A2, or B1 level? If you give them an open-ended uh, um, challenge like this, task like this, more A1 students, uh, level students will start writing simple sentences. Um, there is a bench. Two people are looking at the lake. Um, that might even be a little bit A2, but A2 P, uh, stu uh, level students will start to come up with something a little more complex. And B1 level students will start to write a, a short paragraph. Okay, A2, basic sentence patterns about themselves and other people. Describe the picture, write 35 plus words. In the first A1, I might just say write 25. And for A2, I'm gonna have them write something a little longer and um, give them a task that gives them the opportunity to start to form paragraphs. B1, there's so much they can do at level B1, I would say, probably something imaginative. Pretend that you are one of the people in the picture. Tell a story with 100 plus words. So I'm um, upping the amount of uh, words. So they have to write faster, write more faster. And also I'm making it a little bit more abstract. They can talk about anything. They can talk about the physical situation of one of the people. Um, I'm wearing a hat because the sun is so bright. I think I'm gonna die. Uh, the water is poisoned, <laughs> or um, they can talk about um, it was our 30th anniversary and we came to the same lake and sat on the same bench as our honeymoon, something like that. Okay, so one prompt can be used in many ways. So again, let's say this picture, basketball, we could adjust the difficulty of, of what the students have to write about. Is it familiar or unfamiliar? Concrete, abstract. Did they study it recently? Is it a review of last week's vocabulary or last week's writing challenge? The language of the task prompt. Is it simple, complex, all A1, or some, or some L1? Now, this is especially um, important. If the the language of the task prompt, the directions are more difficult than the student's level, it's going to be a very difficult challenge. Um, if you ask them to write about a lot of things, um, describe the picture is, is a little bit simple. Um, uh, the three men in white are on the same team, but they're in love with the same person. Tell a story about the difficulty in their friendship. That's going to be like probably B2 or B1. So um, also think about the time the students have to complete the task. If the task is simple, the time can be short. If the task is complex, the time can be long. Um, all L2 or some L1, when would I use L1? Um, I might use L1 if I was, if I was um, trying to explain the task, a difficult task, to uh, an A1 or pre-A1 um, student. For example, if I wanted to have a, um, if I wanted to tell the student, write, write, look for colors in the picture. Use one color word and one word for a thing in the picture to make a two-word um, two-word phrase. Now that's too difficult to explain in English to an A1 student. It might be, and I'm not really sure that I actually want them to have to do that. But that's such a complex uh, set of directions that it has to probably be explained in L1. Otherwise, the students just would say, huh, what? What are you talking about? <laughs> okay, so Sefer also is added and focused on written and online interaction. And if we look at this, um, this is again from the, um, uh, from the Council of Europe's, um, from the Sefer Companion volume. For A1 level online written interaction, 
the student can post short, simple greetings um, about what they like, what they, they can respond to comments in a very simple way. They can also react simply to other posts. They can, they can ask a question or maybe answer a question or make a comment about someone else's uh, words or maybe a picture of their family, let's say, or maybe a YouTube video that they posted, um, maybe in their L1 or L2. Um, also, the students can buy things easy on easy sites in a, in a foreign language by filling in details of um, you know, who they are, what their credit card is, and stuff like that. And that would probably be something that we wouldn't be teaching third grade students in, in elementary school, but we will probably be teaching migrants coming to a country and learning a new language. A2, I can engage in basic social interaction, expressing feelings, what I need, what I'm doing, responding to comments, thank you, or apologizing, or answering questions. Simply though, with simple, like short sentences and phrases. I can complete simple transactions as ordering goods, follow instructions, and um, uh, collaborate with someone who is uh, trying to do the same task. B1, I, I can interact about experiences, events, impressions, feelings, uh, especially if there's some time beforehand to uh, prepare. For example, writing an email or um, joining in a, in a discussion forum. I can ask for or give simple clarifications and respond to comments and questions. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't understand when you said um, the red ball, uh, the red ball, ball wobbled outside. What did you mean? Um, I can interact with a group working on a project. This is a little bit more complex. A1 can do things on their own. A2 can work with someone else in the target language. A B1 can start to work with more people and also um, do some kind of interaction online that's based on images or statistics, graphs, to clarify uh, more difficult things that might be online or that the group has to decide about. So let's look at this very quickly. An online discussion forum on, on a familiar topic of interest is always good for extensive writing. Not so much for timed extensive writing though. It's like a blog. Blog would not really fill into timed extensive writing's uh, criteria for um, a good task. For, but if you want to time, a discussion forum. Tell the students to write a post, but only give them 10 minutes um, about an easy question, like what did you do this weekend? Or do you like sports? Which ones? And um, just restrict them to 10, to 10 minutes. They write their post. Okay, save it. And then after that, if they left something out, if they didn't explain themselves, um, their fellow students can open up their discussion post and they can make a comment or ask them questions about the things they couldn't say. So in this sense, if you want to do an online discussion forum in a timed sense, do it as just the first step. So it's also really good to instruct the students outright how many of their, their fellow students' posts do they have to read, how many comments do they have to make, or how many questions do they have to ask. And it's really useful to gamify the assignment by giving students one point, say, for example, out of 10 maximum for each comment. I very often say, okay, write 100 words, you know, or as much as you can in 15 minutes for your post. Um, for that, you'll get five points. After that, read five or six other students' um, posts, ask a comment, make a question, make it a good comment or question, more than 25 words or more than 50 words, and you'll get one point apiece for those. The game of uh, students really, really might not want to discuss you know, sports with, with their fellow students. They can do it much easier in their native language, face-to-face uh, -face or, you know, or uh, chatting on SNS. But giving them points makes it into a game. Suddenly it's not I'm cooperating with the student teacher because I want to learn English. It's because uh, I want to get I want to get 100 points. I have to ask four more questions to get 100 points, and so they forget 
to a certain extent with the, the goal is not no longer learning English. The goal is if I do this, I get points. And that really makes it much more, uh, gives it much more of an extensive, timed extensive feel to it because they're doing it as quickly as possible. And not, they're thinking, but they're not thinking too much about what they write. Okay, uh, A2 plus B1 written in online uh, interaction. I showed you something like this a little bit before from one of the Cambridge, uh, the earlier um, a preliminary or pet test from Cambridge. You've just bought something new. Um, it uh, gives you, um, you have to write a 45 word message or email. So in this case, you bought something new from your bedroom. You're gonna write an email to your friend. You're really excited about it. And you're gonna tell your, tell your friend Teresa what you bought, explain why you had to buy it and tell her exactly how you're gonna use it and where you're gonna put it. Okay, so this is a response to an email. So it's, it's a test kind of, it's a artificial situation, but it's, it's a real, life communication kind of challenge. So how many minutes do you, would you give for this task? And what level do you think it would be best for? Combine that with the, the difficulty of the task, the level, what you expect of them, and um, how long do you think you would give? Now, for my students who are uh, their junior college English majors, they're high A2 or low B1. It takes them about five minutes to do this as an extensive writing task. Maybe a little longer, but um, a lot of them can finish in five minutes. The first time I gave them the task, of course, it was much longer. And um, what I'm using here is something called Moodle's essay autograge that automatically counts the number of words uh, in, in an essay. And um, this student um, needs 45 or more items, words, and they get 50%, 60% if they have about 45 words. So in the rubric, um, I was mostly interested this kind of question has some general information and it says three things you have to respond to. So did you, uh, the number of words, did you answer the question? One to 10 points, depending on how good the student explained the situation about buying something for her bedroom. First point, did she describe what you bought? Second point, did you explain why you needed it? Third point, to say where you were going going to put it. Now this student didn't say didn't say anything about number three. Did you answer the question 10 points? Uh, it was um, okay but not really good so she got a five. Third point nothing and then sort of all oh, she got an 85 out of 100. Now this is she made mistakes but I was mostly interested in these things so I put them into into um, to the rubric so that she could focus on those things when we analyzed the the um, the task when she did more than than one when she did several responses to the task. This is the Moodle uh, quiz auto essay uh, question, and if you're interested if you're interested in this, um, check it out with Moodle. It's an add-on, but it's really useful. You can also specify words that you might want the student to use. Like for example, before I was saying, please use and, but, and, um, and then. So you could set the, uh, the um, this uh, essay question so that if they use and, they would get three more points. The, uh, uh, then three more points, but three more points. Um, Okay, so B1 written in online interaction gets a little more complex. This is also from Cambridge, you can see. It's, um, this is a new Cambridge test that still has an email, but it gives you hints how you have to respond to the email. And um, any kind of email or SNS simulation that, 
that poses a problem or requires an opinion, explanation, apology, suggestion, etc., can be timed. This is especially because B1 students should be exploring or learning, be getting better at using modal verbs. Um, but a genuine discussion of something on a forum is much more natural and untimed. Forum discussions are much more natural, untimed, and interesting, but sometimes they can't be focused on a particular uh, kind of uh, communication or even grammar skill. Mediation is something that um, the, the, the companion volume of Sifra focuses on much more than before. Uh, it just had mediation listed without having any scales for it. Uh, and this is personal response to a creative text. Now, if you let's look down the bottom, pre-A1, no descriptors. I mean, learners at A1 are just coming up with simple words. Um, and uh, uh, have a limited vocabulary. Um, and there are, so there are no descriptors. But students at that level can still respond. If, if you show them a, a, a text can be, it can be a, um, a printed text, a text with, with uh, made of words and letters. It can be a work of art. It can be a picture. It can be a piece of music. It can be anything creative at all. But they use the word text in Sefer just to have a general word so that, you know, it can be, it's sort of like plug and play. If you see text, creative text, it means all of these things. I'm not even going to read B1 because it has so much stuff right now, but pre-A1 has no, almost nothing, has nothing. A1 can use simple word signs to state how a work made them feel. Oh, beautiful. I like it. Uh, uh, oh, it's big. I can express the react, A2 can express reactions to work reporting their feelings and ideas. What aspects of the work interested them? Why they like to work, and uh, and what they liked about a work, in simple language, okay? In simple language, B one can do all of those things in more complex language, and uh, also can um, get get down and dirty and focus on things like describe the emotions that they experienced at a certain point in the story. How did you feel when the when the character was tied to the train tracks, and was and the train was coming? Why did you feel that way? Um, can describe a character's feelings, can get into the, the, the character, can describe a character's personality. So now I chose this text, the, um, the screen by Edvard Munch. And um, it's not something I would use for children, most likely. I might, but no, probably not. But when we think of pre-A1, pre-A1 is not all just children. Pre-A1 pre -A can be adults that are learning the language for the first time too. And in that sense, one word answers could be very good. We just, oh, tell me, look at, look at this guy. Tell me one word. Uh, look at the person who's screaming. Tell me one word you feel. And I might explain that in the, in the student's L1 and expect the answer to come in the L2. Simple words express feeling. How does the picture make you feel? write one or two sentences. I feel scary. I feel um, afraid. A2, report feelings, express likes or interest. Do you like the picture? How does it make you feel? Is it interesting? Write 25 plus words. I might even write more than that, depending on the time I gave them. B1 has too many descriptors to talk about, but um, I might say describe the picture and how you think the character feels. Something more open-ended that the, that the writer can, can latch on to in a longer amount of words. Okay, so we're almost at the end of different types of writing. So the short exam essay. And uh, high school and college, uh, the five-paragraph essay is the queen of of uh, junior high school, high school, and um, beginning college language classes in some places of the world, at least, not every place. Some places start a little later. 
So we've, we've all been probably through it at one time or read about it. Descriptive essays, process rate, essays, describing process of giving opinions, comparing and contrasting, blah, 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 blah. These are really important things to learn, but they have a negative reputation sometimes because they were taught without being communicative or without being fun. But these essays are extremely important for many students. What about time ex extensive writing? Well, again, do you use time extensive writing or not? It depends on what you want to teach and why you want to teach it. You should design a task and rubrics on, on limited scope to match your goal. If you want to do a short exam essay, don't do five paragraphs, maybe just do one paragraph. Um, and is this, it's good, for, especially for pushing students' fluency in thinking and deciding quickly what to write. So if there's a test and you want to reproduce the test, a one paragraph test, for example, why not give the students less time than on the test? Really, you know, make it, um, make it like a game. Or sometimes give them less time, sometimes give them more time so they get a feeling of how they can do the tasks. So some people say the test taking really the tasks are not authentic. And I, I think that test taking related tasks, teaching for the test has become authentic because these tests and these kinds of tasks are really important in our students' lives. They're very high stakes. They may decide the future, have an effect on their lives or, or um, what school they can go to. So the audience in this case, it's a, it's a productive task. The audience is understood. They're the TOEIC or the IELTS or the teacher, the raters, the people who rate the tests. You can also make the audience the students' uh, peers, their uh, co-students, fellow students. The reason for community with the text is get that job or enter that school. And the genre is whatever the test requires. The teachers, uh, the students essentially are communicating with the test raters according to the genre rules in what is, but what is in reality a, a disconnected, somewhat disconnected, but real life goal. Communication with the educational establishment, with the larger impersonal hierarchical society, but by whatever means necessary. This kind of stuff is important for students. Maybe not so much for us, but for students. And in this kind of sense, I'll go through this quickly, uh, Sefer focuses on some things for the deal with writing essays, giving opinions or, or describing things. And you can notice that on the lower levels, there are no descriptors available. But at A2, a higher A2 comes up and can tell a story in, with the simplest of points, can give an example of something in a very simple text using like or for example. Um, here we have shows awareness of conventional structure of the text type. That would be one of the genres. Um, can do a straightforward narrative or description as a sequence of points. Can clearly signal chronological sequence in a narrative text. Can develop an argument. Coherence and cohesion. Again, pre-A1, no descriptors, but a1 can link words and signs together to give a message with, say, and or then. A2 can link groups of words with simple connectors, can make simple, can use those simple connectors to link simple sentences together to, to tell a story. And B1 starts to really flower, can make a simple logical paragraph um, with breaks, even if it's more than one paragraph, can form longer sentences and link them together can link a series of shorter, discrete, simple elements into a connected story, a connected flow of, of uh, text or argument, can introduce a counter argument in a simple discursive text, for example, with however. So um, propositional precision, um, again, pre one this time has something can communicate very basic information about personal details in a simple way. The goal is to communicate about yourself. Can communicate basic information uh, and needs of a concrete type in a simple way. It unfolds a little bit. A2 
can say communicate what they want to say in simple and direct exchange, but sometimes they have to compromise the message because they don't have the words, uh, the vocabulary, or the or the uh, language structures to express themselves clearly. B one, well, usually they can get the point across. They can come can give simple information, it's important, and um, express what they think is important. They can explain the main points of an idea or a problem with reasonable pre precision. So this is basically um, the, um, the praxis of, of the essay, the style of genre of the essay. Vocabulary range of control, again, pre-A1 just has scattered vocabulary, so there's not a lot of range or control, but basic repertoire, good enough for survival needs, basic communication needs of vocabulary, enough vocabulary to conduct routine everyday transactions in familiar situations or topics, uh, has a good range of vocabulary related to familiar topics and everyday situations, has sufficient vocabulary to express themselves, okay? Um, control, not very much control of vocabulary in pre-A1 and pre -A, um, in A1 levels, but A2 has a narrow repertoire and B1 has a wider repertoire. Grammatical accuracy, again, very simple to more complex. So pretty much that gives you an idea of Sefer and the way Sefer approaches writing. From now, I'd like to look a little bit, look into um, what kind of uh, media and topics are available. So topics and con con concepts, you know, the best bet you can do if you're looking for ideas or words, vocabulary, to be prompts for extensive writing or extensive time writing, is to match your assignments with your students' other textbooks. So, for example, um, my students are studying uh, expressing their emotions in their oral communication class. Okay, and the oral communication class has a list of twenty emotions that we want to talk about. They want to talk about. So I just take those emotions and I and I put them in a in a uh, extensive um, writing category, essay question list. And I just say, tell me about a time you were, ten, ten, ten. tell me about a time you were happy. Tell me about a time you were sad. Tell me about a time you were angry. And so the students have to write an essay about one time in their lives when they felt that emotion very strongly. Um, it's very simple. It recycles the vocabulary and also the uh, structures, the ability to communicate the students have been learning in other classes. Google, for example, I Googled opinion topics for the third grade and I got a, an amazing amount of wonderful topics. Graphics, Any, we use the picture of, the, of uh, the basketball court and also the woman and man sitting on the bench in, in, the, in front of the, the lake. And there are so many graphics that are copyright free um, free of copyright, that are uh, public domain, or that are um, Creative Commons, which encourages people to use your 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 creations, and you can find them in Wikimedia, Wikimedia, in Google. Creative Commons has a search engine uh, that we can browse over 500 million images, and it explains what how you how you have to attribute the the creator of the image or not with each image. It's really great. Um, many governments, NGOs or museums have pictures or um, audio or video from their collections that are available to the general public on, as a public domain service. And um, I'm from the US, so I'm especially aware that the US does this for almost all of their materials, all of their media. More media and topics. Well, hey, YouTube, B BBC. It's only six minutes long. It's a really charming story. 
And you can use this especially for the A2 or, or B1 uh, levels of challenges by asking what character do you identify with? What did you think? What if you change the if you change the um, ending? What would you change it to? What do you, how do you think she felt or you know things like that? Um, Ted is also really good, and Ted has a whole series of Ted Ed um, videos that are about they're under five minutes. Over Most the course of the nineteen sixties, the FBI amassed almost two thousand documents in an investigation into and this is especially good for b1 students who need the challenge to broaden their range of vocabulary and um, the ideas they feel comfortable or topics they feel comfortable talking about another media source i really like is lo.org and um, the uh, lo.org uh, has hundreds of thousands of videos and also audio files that they um, offer to the public with it, if you give them um, attribution. Teacher made slideshow talk, um, recorded on Zoom or Google Documents. I'm recording this slideshow on Zoom and just uploading it to YouTube. You could do the same thing with um, a short two minute um, explanation or demonstration that you ask your students to respond to uh, in, a, in a Moodle uh, essay, timed essay. Almost anything can be uploaded to YouTube and embedded in Moodle. Almost anything can be uploaded to Google and embedded in Moodle. So it, it, it lets you stress the, stretch the ability of uh, Moodle to involve uh, more complex and uh, heavier uh, File, have your file size media in your um, in your assignments and your uh, in your um, questions if you're using Moodle. So that's basically it. We have a um, you can go back to this if you'd like. Um, especially, I really really um, appreciated Cambridge's resources this time. But Cambridge, other public. Um, uh, other publication houses also have lots of good things. Um, but thank you. Um, I really hope you enjoyed some of this. It was very long. Um, but if you're interested, if you have any questions, please feel free to email me. Also, if you'd like to receive some Moodle quiz extensive writing resources that I've developed, please contact me. And note that resources should be spelled with an O. OK, so thank you very much. and I. Greatly appreciate your putting up with this long presentation. Hope you enjoyed it. Goodbye.